Good morning. Hello. Uh, my name is Mark Peralta. I'm the executive director for Best Friends Animal Society. Thank you so much for coming to Exceeding Client Service Expectations in relations to adoptions. This is one of the funnest uh, and my favorite things to talk about because it's so easy. There's a lot of simple things uh, that we can do to really turn a run-of-the-mill uh, run um, interaction into a wonderful interaction which gets us donors, that gets us animals adopted, that gets people to support the cause that we're trying to get people to support. So, um, When I do this presentation generally, um, you know, we talk about uh, what is no-kill and strategies for obtaining successful no-kill um, communities. And it starts, a lot of it starts with client service. And it's not just client service and the things that we think about, like if somebody comes in to adopt an animal from us. Your volunteers are clients. Each other, your staff members, if you're staff members here, they're clients. We're clients to each other. Uh, if you have a marketing team, if you have somebody that's a volunteer, right, that's handling your social media for you or posting your events that you're doing that day, that's a client. So it kind of really gets into um, you know, the guts of, of every aspect of what you're trying to accomplish as either a rescue group or an organization. Um, we're going to talk about it. I'll give you guys a little bit of background on me. We're going to do a quick myth or fact game. Uh, and then we're going to ride into just about client service for a little bit, taking out the adoption stuff, just basic client service, tenants, and communication, then we'll get into actual turning those into um, your adoption policies and how you guys can be really efficient. You can streamline, but you can also provide, obviously, great client service, OK? Um, so my background, I've been at four different places. Obviously, I'm currently with Best Friends Animal Society. I'm not in Utah. I'm in Los Angeles. And in LA, I run uh, with a huge team of wonderful volunteers and staff members uh, two adoption centers and a spay and neuter clinic and then we also provide a lot of resources for uh, grassroots rescue organizations to help us all support the local city shelter system that has six facilities and roughly 50,000 cats and dogs coming in annually okay um, before that though I was in the music business and again, a lot of my client service training, even before that, when I was in college, I was bartending, I was working in retail, I was working in restaurants. And I got some of my best client service training when I had to fake that I wanted to serve you this best, the best drink ever. Like, I, I don't care about drinks, I don't care about serving you a martini, but I need to sell it to you and make you feel like this is the martini for you, right? And it really, learning a lot of that stuff really helped me when I got into things I really did care about, like getting animals into homes. Um, so first off, let's do a couple of myth first fact games. Uh, if you've seen client service presentations, you might know some of this, but I'm going to ask some of you, and I don't want to put you on the spot, because I only got, the first time I ever did uh, this, I only had two out of three. I got two out of three wrong. Um, so don't hopefully expect to um, know everything here, but I want to start with you. Give me your name again. Kelly. Kelly. Kelly, what do you think the percentage of people denied an adoption who obtain a pet somewhere else? Very good. Kelly's sharp. 95%. So basically, somebody wants to get an animal, it's pretty easy to find one. So I want you guys to keep that in mind. Um, it doesn't mean that everybody that comes into your <laughs> and, and equates with your rescue group or your organization is going to get an animal from you. But it's a good understanding when you really try to break things down and provide great client services that they're going to get an animal somewhere. And I don't know about you guys, but my point of doing adoptions isn't just to find everybody who's ready to be an adopter, but it's also turning people who want to be good pet owners, helping them become that. You know, they're not experts uh, all the time when they walk up to meet you. So this is one. How about this? What's your name in the back, in the black and white? Melody. Melody. Oops, I just gave it to you. <laughs> I just messed up. Mel, you're going to ask the you're going to answer the second one. Also, something that's interesting. So you talk about uh, pets as gifts. Pets as gifts. Why do you guys think that is? Why would that make this doesn't make sense to you, right? Doesn't seem like that would be something that would be true. If you haven't seen the study, do any of you guys have an idea of why you think they would be at a decreased um, rel relinquishment rate? That's exactly right. My mother couldn't get rid of those ugly cats I kept giving her when I was a little kid. It's true. We would find these straggly little cats, and I, I found a stray, but therefore gifted to my folks um, a, a nice little cat, and there is some truth to that. 
doesn't mean that we at Best Friends promote and say, gifts, you know, hey, did you think about giving an animal as a gift today? But when we have to go through and we're having a conversation with somebody and they want to gift something for their wife, their husband, their brother, they know really well, it's not always a no for us because statistically, the, the risk, if you're, if you're afraid of those animals coming back or not being able to sustain in a home, then the facts don't play out into your favor. Yeah. Right. <laughs> what a wonderful gift. So, Melody. To D or an N? Melanie or Melody? Melody. Okay, Melody. The depth of bond with companion animals is greater in low income households, the same in low and high, or is it greater in high income houses? Households, sorry. That's what I would guess too. Yes. So, if you look at the study that this was done, Daniels basically points out to the fact that oftentimes when people are easily, have completely a lot of income to do whatever they want with, sometimes they don't tend to um, hold those items that they're getting uh, with the same esteem than people that don't have a lot, right? And they actually have to sacrifice or have to, um, you know, it, it's a really big decision for them because it's a big part of their income. I grew up very, very poor. My dad, uh, I actually grew up in, in, in different, my mom actually was rather wealthy, my father was very poor. So uh, I remember when I was in school, um, a girl came up to me it, it, with all nice intentions and she told me, wow, you, um, your jeans always look very nice. She said, you must, uh, you really take really good care of your clothes. And I remember that being a very big insult to me because it was obvious, I only had two pair of jeans. <laughs> so I took very good care of my jeans, but for me I was very sensitive about it but I took very good care of them because I didn't know if I was going to have another pair of jeans or what it, you know, where they were going to come from or those kind of things. But it was something that I always think about when I, when I, well, the first time I read this and every time I give this presentation is sometimes with many people that if they don't have a lot of money doesn't mean that they care less and actually sometimes and statistically can sometimes care and figure out uh, uh, more solutions to things that they really value, like an animal. So when you talk about adoption fees, remember this. Okay. Okay. Words have connotations, right? So I took French when I was um, in high school. And I'm sorry, what's your name? Your name is Sarah. Sarah, if I say to you mansion and I say to you house, what's the difference to you? Mansion's big, shiny, extravagant. But in, Fran in French, maison, house. That's where it came from. And the same thing for me applies to, and words mean a lot to me, and client and customer are the same thing. I know this is customer in the title, but it has a different connotation to me than client. So when I say client to you guys versus customer, what's the difference to you? Yeah. It's a relationship based. One of the things, we're going to talk about the five impactful, you know, you know five things to counsel for. One of the things should be that we want you guys to come back to us. We want to be your resource. Because that's how you maintain donors. That's how you, but you also maintain that thing that you're worried about, right? That those pets are going to be OK. They're going to be in a good home. Um, and that's a client. Lawyers have clients, right? And you think about those kind of things. Customers are usually one-time transactions. And I think you guys should really think about little things like that because you want clients. I think whether you're a rescue group or you're a large organization, you want them to come back when they're ready for their next pet. You want them to think about you, you know, at the end of the year maybe when it's time to give for an organization because they're your client. They feel, you know, obligated to support you. So, okay. And I've, uh, if you guys have seen this before, it's, it's uh, in e almost every uh, client service training that you'll have, you know, in every aspect. I saw this the first time when I was doing retail client service. Um, and it's still true today. So, negative impact. Um, I would argue when I lived in Philadelphia that more than, uh, excuse me, fewer than 96% uh, 90, of people wouldn't complain. But I think for the most part and everywhere, uh, people don't. And you think about your own interactions. You guys probably experience some sort of pretty poor client service on a regular basis, whether it's at a gas station or a restaurant or whatever, cab. You went to the airport and the TSA agent was, you know, whatever. Most of the time, it really takes a special kind of somebody to make you guys complain. You know, but it doesn't mean that you don't experience poor or 
um, not so good client service. And that's the fact. So 96% won't complain, but they will tell people. So if, she, if you came into my shelter, Sarah came into my shelter and said, you know, she had a really horrible experience. She might not go and yelp and blast my shelter right away, but what's your name? Ashley, Ashley goes and she's talking with some friends at a table and said, oh, I'm going to go and adopt an animal. I'm going to go to Mark's shelter. And she, oh, what do you think she's going to say? <laughs> exactly. So she might not be on Yelp doing it, but then she's going to tell people, especially when that subject matter comes up. And it's something to understand. And the one thing is, you know, everybody talks about, we got to market more, we got to market more, we got to market more. But if you don't have good client service, it can turn into marketing against yourself. Because you're getting people in and now you're creating 10 new people who will never experience you that will never come and see you again. Um, and it works both ways. Unfortunately, not as much. We tend to be more of a negative Nancy type of culture where we want to talk about bad things more than good things. Um, but you will still see if she had a great experience, same thing happened. She'd say, oh, you've got to go to Mark's rescue. Go see that guy. He'll take care of you. You know, the staff's great. Yada, yada, yada. Really quick, you have different methods of communication, right? And I think, obviously, you know, you have... Um, so what we're talking about today, that's me right now. What's coming out of my mouth, what my body's doing, how loud I am, how soft I am, how quickly I'm talking, all of that is that message. And the receiver right now are you guys. But you'll see that there's three different, you know, you have what the words I'm saying, how I'm saying them, and then what my body's saying to you. That's really communicating to you guys. And 55387 is pretty well known breakdown of how people actually receive messages. Okay? So we just had Valentine's Day, right? And my fiance said to me, you know, um, what do you, you know, what do you want for Valentine's Day, Mark? And I said, oh, nothing. Every day is Valentine's Day with you, sweetheart. You know? And she's like, okay. So she listens to what I say, right? And then Valentine's Day comes. And she gives me a card to tell me how much she loves me. But that's all she has. Um, and maybe I wanted a little something more. Or maybe, you know, maybe I wanted to go to a nice dinner or things like that. So she hands me the card. And I say, thanks. And I walk away. The words that I'm using are fine. Gratitude, thank you. Mumbling, low, looking at the ground. How do you think she's going to walk away from that interaction? She's going to say, he's full of crap. Now he's upset. This poor baby, you know, he wanted more. Why can't he just be honest? You know, I'm just asking him the question. I want the answer. But it's things like that. For those of you that have staff or volunteers that do adoptions, you know, you'll meet somebody and sometimes you'll hear the craziest things, right? And you have to sometimes talk to people a little bit more. But if, if something turns someone off, right, and your body starts saying something that maybe your mouth's not, you know, it's going to really, it's going to skew your message. So when see people talk to you, there's a lot of people that have a really big issue when they're talking directly with somebody. And if they're looking around or they're looking on their phone or they're doing that, it really takes away, right? And it's, and it, and it's hard for you, you know, as the person sending the message to even communicate because body language is so important. We work with animals, you guys. They are so in touch. That's how they communicate, right? They do have inflection. They don't have words. But just like us, and just like us, they're very in tune with body language, more so than us, but so are we. And how we gesture or how we present ourselves or things like that really do go a big way into how you send your messages. OK. I'm going to do a demonstration for this. And this is important for those of you guys that want to do um, send any message. So if you work in a spay and neuter clinic, right, and you want to give post-op instructions, to somebody who's getting their pet back. If you want to do an adoption and you're trying to tell them everything that they'll need for that, you know, that animal to be safe at home, right? If you're talking to somebody in the airport and they say, what do you do? And you want to talk about if you're with Austin Pets Alive and you want to tell them about Austin Pets Alive. These are all things that I want you to remember, OK? So how many of you remember White Man Can't Jump, that movie? White Man Can't Jump, Wesley Snipes. It's, uh, in the movie, there's an argument between Woody Harrelson's character and Wesley Snipes' character about Jimi Hendrix and whether you can listen or hear to Jimi. And it's the same concept that we're going to talk about here. You hear. So here's our message, right? So this is even my presentation to you guys today. So this is it. All of what I'm saying is here. So 
Now, you guys might be a little higher because you have some interest in this, but if you want to talk to me about chemistry or you want to talk to me about opera, this is what my retention level is going to be with you. And this is what the retention level for most people that come in to talk to you or experience you have. They're not experts in animal welfare. So they're going to hear right away, just hear <laughs> the words, what's going on, 50% of what your message is, right? Now, what they hear and what they listen to is a separate thing. So then you're going to take 50% of what they hear away. OK? You guys still with me? And then they're going to retain, meaning what they're going to remember, 12%. My staff, when I hear my adoption counselors going into war and peace, when they're talking about adoption policies, I'll just go behind them and go like this, and they know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Stop it. They don't get it. There's too much there. Don't go into your dog story about crates and this, this, and that. Like, you have to read the person and understand. Now, if you and I want to chat about adoptions, you probably have you know, an interest level. So you're probably going to have a little bit more than 12%. But like I said, if you want to talk to me about opera, so it better be short and sweet. All right, couple quick things. I want you guys to remember guts. And I try to put a picture that you won't forget. Okay? I'm going to give you a couple quick small things to do to make somebody's experience go from good to great. Okay? Little things. Super easy. Super simple. So obviously greeting people is important. And as much as you don't think that happens, we're all so busy doing what we're doing at times, whether we're um, working in our places or we have an event and there's all kinds of people coming up. Greeting is really important. It's the first acknowledgement that you even know the person's existing. And for them, that's pretty important to them, right? So greetings always should be open-ended. If you are sitting at an outside adoption event, obviously your, maybe your intention, first and foremost, is to get an animal adopted. But there's other things that person can do for you. And don't limit them, even in your greeting, as to what that can be. They might give you 20 bucks. They might want to say, I want to volunteer. I want to do what you're doing. Right? How may I help you? Great greeting. Open. Limit list to the answers. Not, are you looking for a cat or a dog? Or are you looking to adopt today? Those are, yes. I mean, also, those are closed. You can say yes or no to those. Or which animal are you trying to adopt today? I guess it would be open, but you're still closing it off, if you see what I'm saying. Because you're, you're already making the assumption that they're only here to adopt. So if you guys work in centers, too, it's really important to note. A lot of adopters, a lot of people that want to do a lot of different things, are going to come and, and experience with you. Some of my favorite greetings are just looking at somebody in the eye and smiling. You know, so I'm working, if you're working in a kennel and you're cleaning and things are going crazy and somebody's just walking by, a lot of times it's, it's just that. But some kind of, I know you're here. If you're working at like an adoption event or, um, you know, working at a center, a lot of times it's just letting people know where they are. You know, it's like the DMV. Even if, even if you're number 88 and they're only serving 33, at least those people know kind of where they are in the process. And a lot of times that goes halfway into meeting somebody who's just like, tell me I'm not going to get lost. Because the worst thing that they can fear is if they're at an adoption event with you and there's all these people. And I'm kind of laid back. I don't like to shove in there and be you know, too dramatic or too um, aggressive. But what I am afraid of is what if the aggressive person comes in and I've been waiting here for 20 minutes and then they come in and I'm just going to get fed up and leave. You know, and potentially could have adopted an animal. So a lot of times it's you just taking control and saying, hey, I see you there. I got a couple people over here. Why don't you take a look at this? Here's our adoption survey if you want to start looking at that. And I'll be right with you. You know, this, this, and that. Um, names. Please, use names. Hi, what's your name? Aubrey. Aubrey, I'm Mark. You know, so somebody comes in. It's just like one of those little things that a lot of people don't do. But if you ask them their name and say, hey, great, you know, great, Mark, thank you for coming in, you know, and sometimes you repeat it to yourself so you can kind of get it, because I know a lot of people, especially me, I'm not very good with names. Um, so a lot of times I have to do like associations, like uh, Kevin, Kevin, my, you know, high school best friend was Kevin. I remember Kevin, Kevin, you know, I actually have to stop and kind of do those kind of methods. But, you know, somebody walking into your center and you ask them their name and then they leave you know, maybe half hour, 45 minutes later, and you remember it and say, hey, Kevin, thank you so much for coming in today. Please come back and see us. Um, little things, but they're like, wow, all right. And you guys in the South, especially, are good with this. You know, Philadelphia, we weren't so good with this. I remember after a year of living in Philly, I went to Louisville, Kentucky, 
And that was the first time I realized I had been Phillyized because I walked out of the plane and somebody was super friendly with me and they were like asking my name and things like that. And it swept me off my feet. And this was at the airport. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I forgot what this felt like. Um, and you guys are really good at it too. I've had, the, uh, the hotel here has had exceptional client service. Um, and it means a lot, you know, and it makes, um, you know, it makes you want to come back. Thank people. Thank them, thank them, thank them. Little things. Little things. And I guarantee you, doing those kind of things and telling your staff to make sure you're greeting people, use their names, tell them your name. Um, thank them for whatever they're doing or whether they're not doing. Thank you for even coming and talking to us. If you ever find it in your heart to donate, please, here's our website, whatever. Um, and smile and just serve their needs. That's the how may I help you. If you're coming in and you want to volunteer and all I'm asking you are questions about adoption, that's kind of frustrating because that's not what she's here for and we're making assumptions and that's what she's here for. Well, we're adoption center. Why else would she be here? Because she maybe wants to donate or maybe find out more about what you're doing. Okay. So when we talk about high volume, you guys, or open adoptions with client service, I want to preface something by saying um, there's a lot of good ways to do animal rescue. And they're not, don't always have to be mutually exclusive. But the one thing I want you all to understand, whether it be Austin, Charlottesville, Reno, where I was, Los Angeles, anybody that's starting to make moves towards being a no-kill community, somebody is picking up the mantle of open adoptions to move that needle to really get over that 90 percentile. Doesn't mean it has to be you, but I want, even if you don't agree with open adoptions, I want you to understand the purpose and, and how they serve and the statistics around why people are doing it. Because we're not recreating, you know, there's other communities, Austin's a good example, that do this method. But I don't want you, if you're a small rescue, to think, well, if I don't open adoptions, I have no place in this rescue game, because that could be farther from the truth. You do have a place, but what we don't have a place is fighting over why I do home checks and you don't. Because that's not productive for animals, and it's against, and it causes in your, you know, it's like a marathon, you guys, and it's like, oh, I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go down this rabbit hole for a while and argue with this rescue over, you know, who's right about home checks. Because, you know, it's just, it's not worth it. And what we need to keep in mind is that 10,000 a day dying in uh, animal shelters all across the country while we fight about what the right thing to do on a survey is or those kind of things. So, all right, we're going to get into adoption policies a little bit and, and talk about client service along with this. So a lot of times, you guys, when we do strict controls, we gauge that as being, uh, excuse me, um, strict requirements uh, equal good controls. And that's not always the case. And the fact is, um, in an interview process, when you're giving somebody a lot of um, questionnaires or you're you know, giving them something that is just you know, extremely long, a lot of time innately. So if any of you guys have ever taken personality exams, have any of you guys ever done that? No matter what you do, <laughs> It's human nature to be like, oh, I know I'm this, but I think this is the better answer to this. You know, and you're, you're starting to, st to stream away from being honest. And that, it's because the way the questionnaires work, it makes you think there's a right and wrong. And a lot of surveys are set up to be, are you worthy of adopting from me or are you not? And this is what's going to help me determine that. So instead of somebody being completely open with you, they're going to say, I want to tell you know, Aubrey the right answer, right? Because I want Aubrey not to judge me first off, but secondly, I want to get this animal. I love this cat, right? So it um, doesn't always work that way, you guys. So I want you to understand. And another thing that people do too is like, oh my God, you know, I adopted this animal in 2007 and I didn't ask this question and this happened. So now from ever on, every animal, even if it doesn't equate to it, I'm going to ask this question on every survey. So it's like, you know, almost like punishing the masses um, you know, for, you know, something that happened maybe once or twice. And that tends to be because we don't want bad things ever to happen, ever. Um, and I get that. Okay, so one of the things that you guys are going to have that plays to your advantage working in this field, right away I can tell you, is that most people that come to see you have a couple things in common. One, many of them that enter your centers, that go to your event, or whatever it is, are going to come with a bit of um, insecurity to you. And let me explain that to you. So when I was 17, 
I got my first managerial job ever. I had like the dirty little mustache, you know, little kid, but I was really excited and I got my tax return and I was ready to go, right? And I remember the first time I went in and I didn't know anything about matching suits. I didn't know what cufflinks were. I didn't know, you know, I didn't know any of that stuff. But I knew like I wanted to look the part for this new job I was gonna have. And I remember walking into um, the store and I was just completely disregarded. Because I was 17, I was a 17 year old kid. And they're like, you know, well, I work on commission. This kid's just in here shopping. They just made a bunch of assumptions, right? I had $2,000 in my pocket, ready to spend it, ready to buy it. It's like the pretty woman, right? <laughs> you made the biggest mistake in your world. But that's exactly what it was. That was my pretty woman experience. And I went to another store. Um, actually, ended up going to a mall, and I went to another store, and it was a Banana Republic. And there was a really nice lady that just walked me through it. She walked me through how you do socks, how you match. You know, don't do this, these colors together. It's not traditional, like, you know, but she was really nice. And she took me, she respected me, and she, it was okay for me not to know how to match a suit because everybody has to buy their first suit. Right? Or, you know, ladies, you have to fire your burst gown sometime. Right? And it stuck with me. I still shop at Banana because of that. It really stuck with me. I came in insecure. I wasn't an expert in suits. Most of the people you're going to experience are not animal experts. Or they come from a background that maybe don't pose them to be at the level that you are. That's why we exist. We're the experts. We're here to help people. So if they don't know this, great, sponge. The worst people to deal with are everybody that knows everything, right? Those are really the challenges. But we tend to punish new, new pet owners and things like that because we're like, oh my god. I had a lady that walked in, right? And she said, um, you have to feed your cat every day. It's real. So my adoption counselors are like, you know, oh my god, Mark, there's a lady that's asking da da da. I said, great, what was, the, what was your follow-up question to that? I'm like, well, what do you mean? She said, she, you have to feed your cat every day. She obviously can't own a cat, right? And um, so I said, go ask her some more questions. There's, there might be a reason for this. This is a true story. This just happened. So I teach these in Austin. I live, I mean, I'm the dude that teaches this, and this is my staff asking me this. So I'm just like, go ask them more questions. There's probably a, you know, go find out. So anyway, she talks to her. Well, the lady actually comes from an animal background, but it's large animals. She, works in a, she worked in a zoo. Um, and she worked with large cats. Do large cats eat every day? They don't. Cat? Cat. Um, so once she kind of got a little bit of understanding, but again, if you check off on a survey, you know, are you going to feed your cat and dog every day? Oh, no, that's really bad for them. No, I'm not going to do that, right? Or she's going to say yes, but I've never got that educational piece to say, hey, you know, domesticated cats are different than tigers you know, what you're used to. But you just, you can't expect to know what everybody's background is, and it doesn't make them an idiot. But if you treat them like an idiot, it's going to stay with them. 95% of them are going to go get an animal, potentially without the support that you are going to be able to provide them. And that's a lose-lose for the animal, for you, and for your client. Okay. This is the highest, oh, I always forget, I have a fancy pointer. This is the highest I've ever seen this. Most studies show about 23, 20, 25% of people actually get animals from rescues or shelters. So if you guys want to fight over you, this rescue is taking all the adoptions away from this rescue or that shelter is doing fee waived adoptions and they're taking all of the adopters, they're not your problem. Your problem is everybody else. And the fact of the matter is that it's extremely easy to find animals, free animals. Craigslist, go to Walmart in some communities, you can get a free cat, you know, because there's somebody out there with a box full of kittens trying to give them away or sell them for five bucks, you know. Um, so a majority of people um, find it easy to find pets. So even more so important to blow their socks off by doing little, small little things. And who doesn't want to have that safety buffer of you to be able to call in a couple years, right? So hey, if things go wrong, whether it's 13 seconds after you walk out the door or 13 years after this pet's there, call us. You know, things happen. People have babies, people get divorced, and it affects animals, right? So, you know, that's an opportunity that you have to really have your clients be served. And as a client, that's great, right, to have that safety buffer. 
So one of the things that you guys can do to make it easy um, for adoptions um, that's good client service is letting people know ahead of time as best as possible what you want them to have before they come through your doors. So nothing more frustrating is if I come to one of your facilities or one of your events, you're like, oh no, you gotta have your landlord lease with you. Well, who carries their lease with them? You know what I mean? So if that's something that you wanna require, put that on your website. Put it on something so people know what the game is, you know, know what, and, and they know what to bring. Um, a lot of people, APA in particular, you know, actually talk about, a lot of people are like, well, I don't want them to rush into a decision you know, this, this, and that, I want them to consider things, put some kind of something up on your website about that then. You know, hey, when, you know, when adopting a pet, maybe you should consider this, or you should consider that. It's just a way where somebody doesn't have to go, well, I wish you would have told me that before I came all the way down to your event and was ready to adopt your cat or dog from you. Fees, post-adoption instructions you can even put on there to get them talking about. Maybe they'll come in with questions for you, actually. Adoption surveys. So this is what I was talking about with the interview, right? So a lot of people utilize adoption surveys in the form of weeding people out. <laughs> um, probably not, it's probably gonna work against you and what you really want. What we really want is to really know one thing, what have these people had this pet before? What's their experience you know, with this type of pet? What's their household like, right? So we can help match their pets. Or if it's not a matching situation, because like us, um, in other aspects of maybe oh so dating or things like that, sometimes we go off looks, right? And even and we're going to pick the person that's wrong for us because boy, that person looks good, and that's going to happen in the animal world too when people want to do adoptions. So sometimes, and just so you guys know, sometimes when things you don't think will work out, they can, and they do. So what you need to do is try to give them every resource possible, including call me, and I can we can walk through this because every chance or opportunity you're going to have to talk. It's a new 12%, right, that they're going to get to retain from you. So if, if part of their first walk away is that they can call you or they can go to, you know, reach out to you for help is always going to be important because you can continue that client um, re relationship. But, and it should be fun. To you guys, this work is fun. And we get very caught up in some of the things that we see that aren't so fun. And we do. But the majority of what you do is fun. You save lives for a living. You know, I worked in animal and music business, which people would think that would be the most fun. I have way more fun in the animal world because, yes, do I see cruelty sometimes? Yep. You know, I see people walking away or things like that, but that's not the majority of what I see, although sometimes my brain wants to tell me it is. A lot of what you guys are doing are fun. You know, we're in this room because we had an amazing experience with an animal somehow, some way, that touched us or changed us. And that's what you're providing, either somebody to get involved in helping push that agenda or actually bringing a new family member into a home that might change these people's lives forever, right? That's cool. So again, you guys get more correct information with open-ended conversations and questions. I want to give you guys a quick example of, oh, sorry. Um, so these look like they're very long, but our adoption surveys, which you can't read because it's a small screen, are literally, this is the dog and this is the cat. They're one page. Really basic. I don't care how many cats you've owned in the entire lifetime that you've been here and how they all died. I don't, you know, I don't need to know if you have a swimming pool or not, unless maybe my animal's blind. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that I don't need to have on there. What I want to know is, what do you think your experience, is, uh, your experience level is with this animal, right? Because this is going to start forming how I'm going to counsel you, right? So um, I want to know what your household's like. But it's like if you guys have ever seen the Meet Your Match stuff from the ASPCA, it's really good because basically they break it even down to things like, is your house a carnival? Is it a library? Is it middle of the road? Um, which helps people just kind of understand what you're really asking them. Oh, carnival, I have three boys, they're running around all over the place. So, okay, so I know you want the cat that's hiding under the bed right now, so let's talk about that. Maybe I can find a, a cat that maybe is gonna be a little bit more appropriate. Or if you're stuck on this cat, I want you to expect this cat's probably gonna run, this cat's not gonna enjoy, you know, this. Or I need a cat that's not gonna be, you know, all over my, you know, the, the people that are coming over my house all the time, you know, and I want a kitten. Maybe you should get two then. So maybe it can bring that level of, I need to be with you all the time to two that can kind of interact with one another. Or 
maybe the kitten's not going to be, you know, kittens need a lot of interaction. They need a lot of support. And they need a lot of attention. If you're not somebody that wants to have a cat in your lap all the time or, or doing this, maybe a kitten's not for you. So it's a way for you guys to really start managing those um, communications. So, and it's really it. And every question, the most important thing is I know why we ask all of these, right? So if you don't know what you're really, and really think about this, go home and look at your adoption surveys, and if you don't know why you ask a question, then you should question why it's on there. And if it's because this one time in 2011, this one thing happened and we didn't ask the question, I would question that as well, because potentially by narrowing in and making people go through more hoops, you're gonna lose, people are gonna, you know, only retain or want to only deal with so much. And that might not be something that we want to hear, but the fact of the matter is it's very easy to get animals. And it's very easy to take you away from the equation and go to a pet store or something like that where it's literally a quick transaction and they don't have to deal with anything. And that's not what we want. What we do for like the stuff of how, you know, we want to make sure we talk about landlord issues, right? So we want to make sure if you're getting a large dog that we make sure that they understand that how do you know what your landlord says about you owning a large dog? Do you know what your landlord says about a cat? A lot of places say, okay, great, you do? Yes, you can have a dog. Okay, give me the number because I'm calling the guy. You know, and that's a very standard method of utilizing adoptions. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but it is a bit of a distrusting method. So if you don't, just tell them you need the number. I don't even know why you would ask the question because you're already going to you know, you're already going to check the landlord anyway, so it would just be like, okay, make sure that we get your landlord's number, let's just do it. For us, I don't check landlords. I don't Google map, I don't do any of that stuff. I do, can't, we do counseling. Um, we let people know kind of what the expectations are. Uh, if they go through the counseling, we're fine, but we have a checklist of things that we can hit and saying, okay, you know, they say their landlord's there, they say this, all of that stuff that people try to put on the survey and make the adopters fill out. And it's also a way that if you and I were sharing an adoption, right, so say I'm a volunteer and you're the staff member, and I'm out doing like the counseling and seeing the pets and all of that with them, you know all of the things I went over with them. So you don't have to do it again with the, with the person and then there's, you know, potentially, um, you know, you can help trust each other. Because we're like, well, I, I don't know what Mindy said to him. You know, I need to make sure, you know, she doesn't, you know, she, I don't know if she's as thorough as I am. So it's just a way to kind of make sure that you're hitting all the points and that everybody can kind of work together a little bit more. Because sometimes your adoption processes can take multiple people. You know, you have somebody that's maybe doing the actual, in the computer stuff or whatever you're doing, somebody that's doing counseling, um, somebody that's showing animals, whatever it is. Um, that's pretty obvious. It's people business, you guys. Everything that we want and all of our intended outcomes are gonna happen from people. So whether they're gonna be the people that are gonna adopt the animals that you're so desperately trying to save or the people that are gonna pay for us to do what we do, it's all people. Avoid speaking in absolutes basically means a lot of people are like, oh, this guy, when I got him in and did my temperament test, he snapped at me, can never go home with kids. Understand that kind of thought process, but do note that sometimes animals respond to different things at different times, just like us. You know, put me in a room with, um, you know, a certain amount of people that are shoving and, and partying and mosh pitting and all of that. It's going to change my way of, of how I'm interacting than a, a, a group like you. Or, you know, they just change to different, you know, stimulus. And obviously, if you have a dog that's attacked four dogs, you know, that's where it says avoid. You know, you can say, listen, this guy's attacked four dogs. We really want to place him in a home. He's really good with people or this, this, and that. But he's probably not going to be, you know, really great with other dogs. So if you actually have factual things. But you'll get all kinds of crazy stuff. And we always want to have the right answer for everything. But we just don't. We don't live in a world where we can predict everything that's going to happen with every animal in our care. And no matter what, I'm sorry, you guys, temperament tests are not law. They're not gospel. You can do a pretty good job of getting extreme um, behavior. But animals act differently, and you guys are, are dealing with animals that are so stressed out that it will change their behavior. And you guys need to come to terms with that. I'm an executive director. I want to have the right answers for everything, but I can't. Not all the time. That's important. Cat lady, right? You, what do you mean, do we have to feed a cat once a day? Are you kidding me right now? Did you really just answer, ask me that question? You know, wall comes up, communication's over, right? This is this. Five points of counseling are going to be based on, I wish I could say, every person that walks in the door, these are the five things that you're going to tell them, right? And you guys are good. I can tell you one. You guys, whether you're a group or an organization, you guys 
all should make sure that they know they can contact you, if that's your case, for help if they adopt your animal, okay? But if you and I, sir, are going to talk, do you own cats or dogs? Yes. Which, both? Uh, uh, dogs. dogs, okay. So if Lawrence comes in, who's owned dogs potentially his whole life, and I start with, did you know you have to feed your dog? Did you know that you know, dogs like walks? Those kind of things. These are things that Lawrence probably knows, right? Um, but with Lawrence, he doesn't know this dog. So maybe my fight points of counseling are going to be more about how to match what he's experienced with this dog, right? Because he's only going to retain so much. But if I start making him feel like, whoa, this guy, he, I look like the idiot because he's told me, like, hey, I've had dogs my whole life. And I can talk. And sometimes people don't. Maybe they've owned dogs, but you do start with the basics because they've never owned dogs. Um, you know, for some reason, they've never owned dogs in the, ho in the ways and hopes that we, we would hope for that. You know, yes, you do have to feed your dog every day um, kind of thing. But... If he was a brand new pet owner, I might want to start talking about the, the benefits of walking dogs versus just throwing them in the backyard and those kind of things. So it's really going to depend on the level of experience your person that you're talking to is at, okay? So I'm breaking my own rule, but if you guys have and you're trying to counsel somebody and you have an animal in the room, this is probably going to reduce to even less of a message. It is the perfect opportunity to get information from them, all that stuff that you want to learn on the survey, because you don't got to think about that stuff. How many kids do you have? What's your dogs at home? Tell me about your lifestyle. That's perfect to do with the little dog or the cat that's in the room. But when you're trying to actually instruct them, at all times, if you can, try to do it without pets around, because it's going to, you can't compete. Can't do it. Post-adoption support. Mike Cavanaugh, unfortunately, right now is going over this in his. Um, seminar like much more thoroughly, but it really depends on us. For us, you know, we do, you know, 6,000 or so adoptions, so we want to make sure that we reach out to people, but we're also not tracking everybody down to make sure that they talk to us. We're going to send them within 48 to 78 hours a follow-up and saying, hey, we're your resource. If you need anything, we're here. Love you. We'd love some pictures. Love an update. Let us know. And then after that, we potentially do a phone call if we don't hear from them, and then we leave it be because, unfortunately, not everybody wants to talk to us again. But we want them to always know we're here. Um, hard to deal with, with people sometimes because they want to know and they want those six-month follow-ups. But if you, you know, sometimes with adopters, they're very happy to work with you. doesn't make them bad people, but they don't want to carry on a relationship with you all the time. But if you do a good job when they're looking for what you specialize in again, they're probably going to think about you. Scary, right? People think when they see that kind of stuff, don't worry. Um, there's a lot of studies out there. I won't get into, to, into too much, but basically there's no magic number that makes somebody a good pet owner. Most of you in this room have probably gotten free pets. And I know for a fact I have a free pet and I have a dog that I paid for from a rescue, $350, and I don't sit there and look at him and say, gosh, I'm going to go for a walk. The free one's staying here. He's the free one, actually. <laughs> free one's staying here, the one I paid for. Come on, I put more resources into you. It just doesn't work that way. And I know we're like, well, we're animal people. Of course it doesn't work that way for us. But it doesn't work that way for people. Um, if you're a rescue group, I know adoptions are important to you sustaining. But if you want a long-term sustainability, I really think you need to challenge yourselves and really going to have to try to find donors. Because living off adoption fees is going to be really difficult. And the fact of the matter is, the more time you have those animals in your care, the more you're spending on the back end for that great $350 you're waiting for. Okay. This is actually a study that was done in Florida where a lot of people are worried about retention rates with free adoptions. Oh, they're all going to come back. They're going to get surrendered, and, and um, they're not going to keep them in homes. And the fact of the matter is, is that with this study and many studies that are coming out afterwards, there doesn't seem to be any relation to how much somebody pays versus when they bring them back or not. And a few other resources if you guys want them about high-volume adoptions. That's a big one because a lot of times you have to talk. You know, I've had to talk a lot of boards into this. I've had to talk to a lot of volunteers about this. I've had to talk to a lot of staff members about this. If you want resources for high volume volunteers, please let me know. I have a few. Okay, so for us and best friends, we have a, we have a, thank you, we have a um, lifetime commitment to animals. That means that we'll always take an animal back, no matter what. Now with that, um, one of the things that a lot of people are concerned about are returns. We at Best Friends are actually putting it out there that we want you, if you're an animal, you adopt from us, 
What's your name? Devin. Devin, if you adopt from us and it doesn't work out, that's not, we don't want you to, we don't want you to work to deal with an animal that's not going to be right for you or that animal for the rest of your life because you chose to adopt. We want to work through it with you, and if it's not working, we want the animal back, and then we want to provide the animal. We'll learn a little bit about you, a little bit about the animal, and then we can find you know, the pet the right home and you the right pet. That's our intended outcome. Why would I then punish people for returning or doing what I'm asking them to do? I would not. And our intended outcome is not to prevent returns, and especially because, like Austin, LA is getting to the point where a lot of the animals in our shelter system are challenging, straight up. They're not all of the animals that you can just literally let into a house and say, no training needed. You know, they need a little housebreaking. They need a little, little uh, socialization and things like that. And sometimes I'm going to give somebody an opportunity to try to take that on if I feel it's comfortable. And if they don't, I want the pet back. You know, and then I'm going to learn more about what that pet did in that home rather than what it did in my stressed out shelter environment. And so the context, when you hear return in animal welfare, it's like bad. It's like what we hear when we say Bill Cosby now. Like you said, Bill Cosby in 1988. You're thinking Jello. You're thinking funny. You're thinking the Cosby show. You say it now. Oh, you know, and it's the same thing with returns. It's got that context of like, ugh, returns are so bad. Not that I want to celebrate returns, but are they really that bad? I got to have them back, right? You'd rather have it be right. And it's not only for the animal, but it's really for your client. Like, you know. Um... So I just want to challenge your point of view on that and to really think about those kind of things because I don't see that as a nasty word. And high volumes at work and communities all over this country. And like I said, there's a place for rescue that do home checks and those kind of things, but I'm telling you, if you want to move the needle for a lot of animals in open admission shelters that are working their tails off, somebody's got to do the, the high, enough, high volume adoptions as well. So even if you can't buy into it, I just want you to understand it. Because they need, and the last thing that we need is to fight with each other over how we're doing adoptions. We all want the same thing. And in LA, you can see in three years, 23,000 cats and dogs were dying in LA in 2011. It was 18,000 after that, 14,000, now 12. Now obviously some of those are actually euthanasias. So um, we've seen a huge reduction in the amount of animals that are dying in LA and a lot of it is because best friends Took the mold and saying hey, we're gonna do the high volume adoptions in this community. It's cool We got a lot of rescue groups doing a lot of really good work But we'll step in and do that and a lot of it was because we're gonna be able to take the onslaught of people who don't agree with it And a lot of my day is spent dealing with that <laughs> so You guys I went a little long, but I want to ask a couple quick questions